how should producers approach you i get a ton of like dms or emails where i'm just like i know off the bat this is not someone that i want to work with you know Peace, what's going down, everybody? It is the Music Entrepreneur Club podcast powered by BeatStars.com, BeatStars.live, BeatStars.world. My name is DJ Payne One. He's Dame Ritter. We actually do have a special guest. He's the, the early morning latte mason jar sipper, the independent hip-hop rising star himself, Dylan Reese. I know Dame wanted to intro him, um, but Dame also wanted to uh, talk about one of his tweets and why it was totally... Uh, incorrect and I actually agree with it so it's, it's going to be um, Dame versus Dylan and, and, and Payne today yeah, once again it's really not we just discussed that but uh, yes my guy Dylan uh, we I've not known each other for two or three years now maybe more I'm not sure time passes so fast but you know super dope artist singer rapper um, you know I think we worked with him at foundation with, for one project but you know I've definitely been following his path uh, he works with some of the artists that I've worked with in the past. Uh, so, Dylan, man, thank you for being here. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate you. Cool. So, so what? Actually, let's let's. I mean, first, let's just talk about your background. You can let people know, kind of. You know, I mean, we just said your name and, and what you do, but like, you know, where you're from, uh, what you're currently working on, stuff like that. Before we jump into some of the tweets that caught my attention that I wanted to focus on today. Yeah. Uh, so I'm from Massachusetts originally. Um, I've been out here in LA since 2017. Um, been doing music for about a decade at this point. Um, once I got out of college in 2015, I basically decided I was going to move here and try to build relationships out here and try to, you know, just further what I was already doing on the East Coast. Um, so I was able to do that, moved out here with one of my best friends been here since then just hustling and uh yeah i mean this year like we talked about a little bit has been you know rough in some ways obviously we all have our certain uh you know quarrels with the whole covid situation that put all the touring stuff on pause um which sucks because i felt like i was starting to really pick up some momentum like in that area um but you know you just adapt so been putting out a ton of music just dropped a project called rap dylan 2 um that did really well and still going well and then working on whatever's next i got a ton of music in the vault i don't know exactly what it's going to be but uh it's coming for sure dope and the one of the reasons that a lot of the a lot of times like the reason i rock with artists is because they're you know obviously we started at nine o'clock dylan was on point you know and i think a lot of that has to do there's a high correlation between like people that have like gone to school um, cause I just find that like school, whether people know it or not, like gives them structure and gives them, you know, just yeah. a little better sense of profession. I can always tell. And I was actually on a zoom with another artist the other day who I could just tell went to school. Um, yeah. so I'm not, I don't force people into school, but I, I definitely think it gives even artists a good foundation. Um, and I can always tell like who went to school and who didn't. Um, but anyway, the, the tweets that caught my attention, there were two tweets. Actually, the one that caught my attention was, I think, the second tweet. You know, you basically said that the music business is a lot of fun. And then the second tweet was, but it's also really draining. So mm -hmm. let's start with the positive stuff, because I think it's dope to have you on, because most listeners of our podcast are trying to get where you are now in terms of being a full-time independent artist you know and of course you have aspirations of being much bigger and much more successful but to even get it to your point even to get to where you are is very impressive and a very hard thing to do um so let's can we talk a little bit about like what was the inspiration of of the initial tweet of the music business being a lot of fun yeah for sure and also i just want to give some kind of a prelude to that is like this wasn't like supposed to be like a big like serious thing it was kind of just like you know i use twitter as just that was what i was thinking in the moment type of deal but i obviously do stand by what i said because i did feel that way and i still do like depends on the day you know like i think that's 
why I also did it subconsciously in separate tweets because mm. some days it's this thing ever. And then other days it's like, this is just annoying because the people you have to deal with or the conversations you have to have, whatever the case may be. Right. So like overall, like I love the music business, like every aspect of it. And that's why I think I'm somebody that wears a ton of hats, you know, like, I work with a ton of different artists in different ways, whether it's mixing, graphic design. I also started working with a distribution company um, and like a and have like a sub-label there. So like I'm working with artists in a bunch of different ways and I do love it. And I love to learn as much as I can around putting out music and, you know, reaching new audiences, the marketing side, whatever it is. Right. So like, I love it a lot. Um, and also as an artist, like, it's the one thing that gives me kind of a chance to just express myself in an unfiltered way over I see fit, especially being independent. Right. So it's just like when I'm making music, it's just a blank canvas that I can do whatever I want. And the fact that I can do that for a living and there's X number of people out there who want to hear it and want to listen to it and, you know, appreciate my perspective that's like the best thing in the world to me. And I, I don't think there's a better job for me individually. Right. So I think like that's the fun part, you know, I love it, but I also think, and I think all I meant by the second half is like, it takes a certain type of strong will to have a sustainable life in this world, you know, cause I just know a ton of cats, whether it be my friends or people I just come across or whatever that, would have folded a long time ago if they were in my position because I've come across a lot of positions or a lot of situations that didn't work exactly how I wanted them to, or, you know, <clears throat> you're on tour and you broke and you just got to figure it out or like whatever it is. Like, I think it just it takes a certain sense of resilience and like, just like never stopping. Like it's just not an option, you know? And I think that's the part that sometimes can be draining where it's just like, damn, I feel like I've had enough of this, but also that's not even right. really an option, you know? Are, are there any examples that come to mind that you can think of that you can share with people that like maybe didn't, because there's a lot of situations where, you know, maybe you think you're getting some placement and then some other song gets swapped out and you thought you were about to get, five thousand dollars and get your get your song into this video game and then it didn't happen or thought you were signing a deal and then the person that was bringing into the label like yeah to another label like some of some things just don't pan out even if you think they are totally yeah i th i think just in general uh something i've learned over the years and something i've done a, a pretty good job at is not getting too hot or too cold whether you know, it's a good day or a bad day. Like, you know, you, you get to sell out a show and it's fun and you made money and you connected with people, you sell merch. You now, a lot of people the next day would wake up and act like their shit don't stink or they have no work to do or whatever, you know? So, and then on the vice versa, on the other side where, you know, you, you know, whatever it is, you have a bad day in the studio, you can't write shit or something goes wrong and you're just like, yo, it's over for me. You know, I think it's always something in the middle and i think it's it's important to kind of stay as even keel as you can so i think that's like the biggest thing but i mean yeah th i mean there's there's tons of examples and i don't want to go too in depth just because you know some relationships are still in in place and you got to play the game right so i'm kind of jealous of someone like joe budden in some ways because he can just say whatever he wants dylan we talked about the the joe budden podcast on, on oh, this podcast the spotify deal and all that yeah 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 did you watch the podcast where he was explaining everything what was your what's your opinion on just kind of the situation in general well i think it's hard to know like what exactly his contract was saying and what his ex expectations were because obviously coming from him it's going to be very one-sided and skewed like you know if we hit these these kind of tiers, we get X, Y, and Z. And I just think it, there's a there's also something that's misconstrued, like when he's comparing it to Rogan or like the Bill Simmons thing, mm. because Joe Rogan is a licensing deal, which is obviously different. And then the Bill Simmons thing, he has a network of like twenty podcasts or something, yeah, and like fifty. I, I don't know what. 
Yeah. So I don't know, like, I don't, no one knows what Joe's deal was, you know, like, right. was it a license deal? Was it something where they were just trying to buy it out and it was exclusive? Like, so I don't know. I think there's probably some reason why he should be upset, but it's probably not to the point where Spotify is being so unfair that he should be doing what he did basically and just airing it out before his contract's even up. So I think there's some validity to both sides probably. Right, right. And you have a podcast. Do you still do your podcast? Is it a basketball podcast that you that you did? Yeah. Yeah. So we were doing it for about two years. Um, and then I moved across the other side of LA. So we kind of stopped doing it just because it was it just didn't make sense. And then and then the whole thing happened where the season stopped. So it was like we just didn't pick it back up. But I, I we I'm sure we at some point. Got okay. dope, dope, dope. That's another that's another reason I rock with Dylan because he's a basketball fan. And you're a LeBron fan too, right? I'm a Lakers fan, always have been. So yeah, okay. but for sure. Can you can you just let people know kind of like what your team looks like? Because I think some independent, a lot of independent artists are like, you know, when do I get a manager? When do I get a publicist? When do I like they don't? And a lot of people just want people on their team just for help. You know, I know you do a right. lot of. I know you do a lot of stuff yourself. So what does yeah. what does your team look like? Um. So. Like you said, I think I wear more hats than a lot of artists should or even maybe could just because I've done a lot of different things. So I mix all my own stuff. So um, the team pretty much consists of just the producers that I work with. And then I have one guy that I work with at my distribution uh, company. But even that, a lot of them, I'm doing that as well because I'm also working for the company as well. So I've stepped in and done a lot of my own stuff too um i have a lawyer and that's pretty much it man like as far as the creative stuff um producers and like i do all the graphic design i do all the mixing all like the digital assets that you see anywhere that's pretty much all me and then i have kirk who uh shoots video um especially on tour and then you know the tour the tour team is a bit different i bring a band i have a tour manager uh and then obviously the video guy <laughs> so that's where i think the team play comes most most in, into play is, is on the road um but as far as like just the process of making music and putting it out it's really i, I do like i would say 90 percent of it but that's one because i think i have the skill set to do it in a way that i'm comfortable with and i know that it's good and like we're seeing the results that i want so I'm not in a rush to like change it. And also I think I have a bit of like control issue where it's like, I don't necessarily trust somebody unless I've been working with them for a long time. So I'd rather just do it myself. And I think that's how I got to the point where I do all those things even for other artists now, because I had to learn them out of necessity, basically. If that makes sense. Yeah. No, you're, you're really good at like the graphics and like the graphic design and stuff. How long did you say you just learned that out of necessity? Like how did you get, or did you just kind of have a natural talent for it or? Yeah. So when I was in college, I, I was hooping in college for the first, the first year. And then once I started doing the music thing and started getting shows and whatnot around the Boston area, I just was like, I'm just going to go all in and like stay in school so I can buy myself time basically to try to do this full time. Cause like I wasn't making money, but I knew, I had to like put the time in and like go network at shows, go do the whole thing and playing basketball in college just does not allow you to do that (laughs) at all. So uh, basically any elective I had, I just geared towards graphic design, video production, anything that I could use and apply in real life for what I was doing. So I took some classes in school and, you know, they teach you fundamentals. And I think if you just have bad taste and then it's not going to do much for you but right. yeah, just practice and practice and learned it and uh yeah i got decent at it and now i think over the past like year or so i've gotten really good i think where i'm like really confident in that in that skill set as well dope, dope. now that i now that i think of it and you and have you both on zoom i don't know if you work with your producer exclusively but i think you and Payne can make some really dope stuff because I think your your like Payne's production and what you do with the vocals, I think, um, you know, yeah. you might want to. Exp- I don't. Do you work with your producer ex- exclusively? Uh, so I have like a handful of guys that I work with uh, 
I have one dude that I use kind of like to like finish everything. And he's kind of like my go-to guy for that. But I, I, I work with a ton of different dudes, so I'm definitely down. I'm open to it for sure. Good. Yeah, no, I, I agree with all that. Is that, so I noticed that, and I listened to a couple of your, your more recent um, singles and it, they were both produced by rain. Is that someone you've had a, a long standing relationship with? Actually, no, that's like a new, that's a new relationship. Um, I mean, I've known him for a couple of years, but I haven't worked with him until recently, those last few songs. And that was because that project was more in the rap. Space. So normally I do like R&B pop stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. And he was just telling me that I knew like some hard rap stuff. So I was like, yo, send me some stuff. And a couple of them ended up, ended up landing and ended up being like the ones that crushed it on that project. So I'm definitely going to keep working with him. So, okay, as, a, as an independent artist who's really making strides and sustaining yourself, how should producers approach you and, you know, build a relationship with you to the point where you're eventually working together on something? Yeah, that's a great question because I get a ton of, like, DMs or emails where I'm just like, I know off the bat this is not someone that I want to work with, you know? Like, if you... Basically, so the way I like to work with producers is I want to make sure they have a stake in the game, you know, like I don't necessarily want to buy exclusive beats or even leases. I want to like have you part of my team and give you royalty on what we do. So it's like when we win, I'll fucking make money, you know, and obviously there's certain situations where, you know, they want money up front and I'll do that, but I would rather have them succeed as I, you know, so when people just come in and they don't know you and it just looks like a, you know, copy and pasted, like, yo, check out my beat store, you know, $40 for leases or whatever. I'm just like, I'm not even gonna listen to this. Cause you didn't, this isn't a personal connection, you know? And I think that's the biggest thing. Like if you shoot me a DM with no links and you just go, yo man, I checked out your stuff, heard this song, blah, blah, blah. I think we could, you know, possibly make something. Do you mind if I send you something? I'll always listen to something like that, but I think it just has to be, you know, make it a personal message at all times. Like, even if, I hate to say this, but even if you're like lying and you just go look up a song title, like don't be lazy, you know, like right. you don't have to listen to everybody's music before you reach out. I feel like hopefully you would want to, but I don't know. People are just lazy with shit like that. And it, it pays off when you're not, I think. Yeah, and it and it shows too. I mean, I get the, the the personalized messages all the time, and they're just so formulaic. I know that all they did right. was look up a social media post, and then they'll say, "Hey, I really like that recent post of yours," and then they'll type a link in and say, "You know, here's the link as as proof." Come on, man, anyone can do that. But um, that being said, I wanted to pick up on something that you said earlier, which was that it was frustrating dealing with all the people that you have to deal with on a day to day. You know, doing what you do and uh, something we talk about a lot is this romanticized independent hustle where, you know, yeah. uh, so many people are talking about going independent and that's the solution. And you hear it all the time from, from musicians who haven't gotten to the point yet where they really understand the landscape and, and what goes into it. And so you got to stay independent. That's how you win. That's why I, I'd never sign with a label. I would never do this and that. Because yeah. cause independ being independent is like the greatest thing in the world. And for me, you know, I've been, I didn't start wanting to be independent. I started wanting to, you know, get major placements and then focused on being independent, you know, as a producer. And then all of a sudden I'm back to getting placements and I'm dealing with the majors. I'm like, wow, this is the most annoying process ever. This is horror. I'm, I'm so frustrated with it. But then at the same time, I look at what I do on a day-to-day -day basis on an independent level, working with, you know, unsigned artists. And that's, that has its frustrating moments too. And, you know, all of it comes together to create a career that's, that's fulfilling. And overall, I love it. Um, totally. But what, what are some of the, I guess, uh, frustrations with being independent that are, that are unique to being a, a totally unsigned artists. Yeah. Well, I, I think the biggest thing, you know, obviously when you're independent is just the reach and having sometimes a lack of resources, but also 
I think a lot of people use that as a cop out to not take the next step in further, you know, their situation. And they just look at it as like, oh, I can't get on this editorial. So like I can't, you know, <laughs> reach a new audience or whatever. Like you have to use your social media and create content that your audience is going to gravitate towards. And if you keep them engaged, it'll, it'll naturally become bigger and bigger. It's going to be slower than if you, you know, sign a deal and then, you know, the label just pushes a button for you and it all works. Right. But then again, you're going to be giving up X, Y, and Z. So I think it's always a give and take. And what I was, what I was kind of talking about is just like you were saying in the past, like three to four months, I've been having those conversations with different major labels uh, because one of the singles on my last project just started crushing it. It was like going off on TikTok, the whole thing. So like for the first time I was having those conversations every day for, you know, two, three weeks at a time with like different people. And I was just like, damn, this is all about to happen. Like this person's telling me this, this person's telling me that we're about to get the bag. We're about to do this, getting this person on the remix. None of it happened. And I can tell you right now, like, none of it was because of anything I did or said <laughs> like people are just talking. And that's the part that's like really frustrating where once you get to that point, I think people love to like check in and like be a part of the conversation. But like when it comes to actually doing it, there's a longer, more bigger step of doing that. And like, yeah, I don't know. It's just no, like, that, And I, I hate, Oh my God. That that's, I've, <laughs> Witnessed that so many times with with artists who start to gain a little bit of traction, and then people at the labels are like, "I need to, to form a relationship with this guy in case something happens. Let me oh. just keep him, you know." And they might be doing that to a bunch of people. It's like, it's like the dude that's talking to like ten different girls, but not committing, and just kind of like, "Well, let me let's just see. You know, if this falls through, maybe I'll go back to her." And 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 eventually, you you start seeing through that because so many people are doing it and then the second you say okay cool well give me some specifics they can't give you specifics or let, let's have a meeting and then you, you come to the meeting and you can tell something's just not right because it's just they just want to make small talk they don't want to talk about anything you know substantive you know and they're not gonna offer any kind of plan or anything it's just like you know keep doing what you're doing that i think that's yeah. one of the most frustrating things but at the same time, you know, I hear the A&Rs at the major labels all the time talking to independent or, or unsigned artists. And when the unsigned artists say, you know, how do I get my music to you? How do I, how do I get your attention? A, a lot of them are very honest. Like Sean Barron, for example, he'll just say, don't. If you're doing it, I'll, I'll find out. Yeah why are you making music for us? So were, were you ever caught in that uh, mindset of trying to make music for the industry rather than the fans and trying to appeal to the A&Rs and the, and the label heads rather than people who, who care about your music? And, and how did you... Years ago. Yeah, how, sure. how did you get out of that? Um, so I think like the first couple of years that I started and also like I wasn't good and I just had this unrational confidence to what I was doing. Like I've, I've sucked, but I was like, bro, I need to get signed like 10, you know? <laughs> uh, so that was the the times where I was like, who's the A&Rs? How do I get them my music? How do I do this? I'm emailing just cold emailing people probably said some dumb shit in 2012 or whatever it is. And none of it worked. So I think that's the answer of your question. It's like, how did you get out of it? It didn't work, so I pivoted, and I was like, all right, I'm just going to find my audience and just put me out and see what happens. And then, you know, you find them little by little, and now it's the point where it's like I have a nice, you know, loyal, small fan base that is ready when I drop music, and that feels great, and I would care a lot more about that rather than what some dude in a suit thinks that I don't know, you know. Uh, and, and, you know, to offset that, I think what you were saying is totally true about they just want to check in and like in case there's something that happens, I want to have that relationship, which I get. And I think there's a way to do that in a genuine way, which I've had some of those conversations too. So I don't want, you know, 
anybody hear that and just think I hate the music industry or like hate labels or something. Cause there's t- plenty of those relationships that I have in store that I value. And I think they're good people, but it's the, it's the dude that will call you and be like, just hit you on Instagram. Like, yo, I just heard this song. Let's get on a call. I'm an a r Cool. Right. You call them. And then there's like, yo, just heard this. We need to sign you. Who is your attorney? We're sending all this shit. And then they just fucking don't say anything for two weeks. It's like, bro, you don't. What are we? What are we talking about here? You know? Oh, and that's that's bad. That's really bad. It's like, bro, like, do you want to work together or not? Because I, I get off that call, and back to what we were saying before, yeah. I'm hyped shit, and I'm like, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of the next thing. You're like, once this happens, like, how do I pivot and and maximize the situation for myself? Who do I want to involve in it? Right? And then it doesn't even happen. And then I'm feeling like a dumbass, you know? So I think it's just a learning curve, man, of like, yeah, I think it's just, I don't even remember what the question is at this point. I got off on a tangent, but. <laughs> the, the, I, I, got, yeah. I, got, I got two questions for you. The first one is you mentioned that, you know, you realized that you sucked initially. Like, oh, yeah. how, how did you do that? Because there's a lot of artists that need to do that right now. Like, how did you eventually realize like, oh, wait, my music really isn't that good. And I'm demanding certain things for where my talent level hasn't really reached yet. How did you realize that? Um, I think by just lack of support, you know, I'm a strong believer. Like if you put music out at a consistent rate at your best level, like it should see some growth, whether you're getting 10 plays to 20 plays or 30 to 40 or 50,000 to 100,000, whatever it is, whatever scale you're on. I think if you're doing that and you're not seeing growth, there's something wrong with you're doing with what you're doing. And that's just a harsh reality that most people's egos can't face, I guess. So, and to be clear, I never realized it in the moment. I, it's not like I was like, damn, I suck right now. It was, I just kept working in naturally getting better because I cared a lot about what I was doing. And then looked back at stuff from one, you know, one or two years ago. And be like, that shit was trash. Why did I think I deserved X, Y, and Z, you know? Right. And, and maybe I still suck now. Who knows? Like, I don't know. I just, I just do nah, what I can. You, de- <laughs> you definitely don't suck now. I think you definitely, you know, you're, I don't know what you're calling sucked. Like before I didn't hear your music from the early days, but you know, I'll never hear it. From what I hear now is definitely, definitely quality music. The other thing I wanted to touch on is like, you know, and, and Payne said it, uh, a little while ago, he was like, a lot of the people that follow us, they, they glamorize independence. You know, it's like, oh, just stay independent, you make more money, yada, yada, yada. Um, yeah. You know, and obviously, I've seen success in the independent space, but I've seen artists, obviously, there's a lot of artists that are su- super successful being signed. Like, what... Mm-hmm. Would you, and I, and I know that a lot of independent artists, eventually they just sign because they don't know what else to do because there's like, they're like kind of plateau. There's a situation sometimes where they're plateaued or they don't feel like they have the support. They want to get to a next level and they feel like getting signed will get them there. Um, yeah. If, are you a, against signing to a label? And if you would be for it, what would that deal need to look like in order for you to feel comfortable signing to a label? Yeah. Um, I would love to sign to a major for a short term situation just because the way I look at it is I only know doing things independently, whether I'm working with the distributor or just putting it on myself or whatever the case may be. I've never had big money to back what I'm doing or all those resources that we can access with a major label situation. So I would love to do either single deal or even like a one album maybe two depending on what the money is, you know, but like something very short term. So at the very least, if it doesn't work out the way I want, I will learn a shit ton and then realize maybe independent is the route for me or I should go major, but I should tweak things this way because this, this, and this didn't work. Right. That's like my whole, that's my focus right now is not that I'm like trying to get a deal, but like I'm totally open to it and have these conversations and trying to make sure whatever I do next is in a different way that I've done, because I feel like I've kind of done what I can do with what I have, you know, at least to the scale I want to, you know, like I can keep doing what I'm doing and grow little by little, like I was saying before, but also I feel like my music's good enough where 
it can reach those people and see real success, you know? So, um, yeah, it would just have to be a low risk situation for me, which is obviously a lot to ask, which is probably not something that's happened yet because I've been offered situations and I'm just like, this doesn't make sense. I can make more money by myself and not have to give you anything, you know? So yeah. it's like, it, it's a, it's a give and take, but I think there is definitely a world where it makes sense for sure. As it, well, as an independent artist, like, you know, from your perspective, you know, what do you feel is lacking from your current situation for you to really take that next step in the independent space? Like, is it just money? Is it a person, some role? Like, what, what do you feel like if you could snap your fingers and just add that to the team right now, what, what would that look like? Um, well, I don't know if this even applies because I don't know where the world is headed, but for the longest time, like for the most of last year, my biggest kind of concern, not really concerned, but my biggest focus, I guess, was trying to get a proper like booking agent. Um, Cause the touring that I was doing was just based off of my relationships and people asking me to come out and it was great. And those did, you know, the, the tours that I did last year. So I toured with this, <laughs> my homie who goes by the holdup. Uh, and then I toured with another band called Catastro and they, they kind of came up in the reggae ish world. Um, which was like a weird thing for me, but the holdup just found me on Spotify and asked me to come out. So I did 20 something dates with him in the spring. And then I met Catastro at one of those shows and I really clicked with them and they asked me to come out in the fall. I did another 20 something with them. So it was a weird space because I mean, it wasn't though, because their fans were just so open-minded because I, I did all the r and stuff. I didn't do any rap stuff, you know? So it was like, I was doing soul music. It was a bunch of people that were just like high as shit for the most part and just having a good time. And like, it was an adult crowd. You know, these, these bands have been touring for 10 plus years and they really appreciate what I did. And like, I got so many like hardcore fans that bought merch that day right off the bat continue to do that and i feel like in an organic way that's the best thing that i saw work um just in terms of like when i post something now x amount of people are hitting me up and like i know this dozen people or whatever it is are from this show or whatever you know mm -hmm. and uh so i feel like continuing to do that was like kind of my biggest uh biggest goal and if i had an agent to you know, mold those relationships and help me kind of get in the conversation. I feel like I was starting to really become a draw on a small scale, you know, for a tour that pulls three to 500 people a night, you know, I could add value in a direct, direct support slot there. So that was like my main concern, but also like, I don't know if touring is happening, <laughs> you know, when or ever again. So it's like, right. I don't know. I think, uh, as far as like what we have control in now, um, it's not really a money thing. Like if, if someone gave me, you know, a million dollars, yeah, I could use it and it could be helpful. Um, but I don't know how much further that take me without getting like support from editorials or like certain PR that I just don't, I just can't reach without the relationship built in, you know, obviously you can slowly build those independently. Like I met you guys, you know, I'm not on a major label. I met all these A&Rs, whatever it is. So it'll come and things will happen when they're, when they're supposed to, you know, you just, just keep working. That's it. Dope. So what, what I'm hearing and what I'm gathering from, you know, kind of everything that, that you're saying is it seems to me that the fact that you just went into this, maybe you didn't go into it with with this yeah you did you did you kind of made learning your your foundation walking into this because because you started out trying to learn graphic design and all of these things that would help you uh create the the career and the branding that you wanted um you didn't necessarily know what it was all going to look like but you walked into the situation saying to yourself i need to learn this i need to learn everything i can a lot of musicians don't do that. They walk into a situation saying, my music is dope. I need, I need fame. I need money. I need, I need people to, to see the value in that. And unfortunately, a lot of them maintain that attitude throughout their careers to the point where they might, they might be spinning their wheels for 10 years and not learn anything 
because all they're yeah. focused on is making their music and they think that their music should be enough. You, you didn't do that. And I think as a result of that, you have all of these experiences, you know exactly what you can do, you know exactly what you need to do. And so when it comes time for you to partner with somebody or collaborate with somebody or bring someone on your team, hire somebody or even sign a deal if, if, a, if a good one comes along, you'll know exactly what you want and need out of that situation. You know what you can bring to the table. And I think that's just, that's the most valuable thing any artist can have just that knowledge and that foundation of knowing exactly what they need and what they can contribute to a situation. Otherwise, you know, you end up signing a a 10 year management deal with, with your friend's yeah. uncle you know what i yeah. mean and it just becomes a bad situation for you i agree yeah i think you just have to know know your role whether that's going to be big or small and like what you kind of need to fill in the gaps and where how you bring value to that person or company or whatever it is and i think people I, people just don't i think a lot of artists just don't understand business like in a fundamental way like what do I get? What do you get? Why does this make sense for everybody? Right. I think they're just like, I want everything and you should give it to me because I'm dope and I'm cool. And people like me where it's like, this doesn't make sense. You know, I think that the, that's the part where you said like independent, a lot of independent artists are like, fuck the majors. I don't need them. I'll always be independent. But if you're not grinding as an independent artist needs to, then you're just basically never, it's never going to work, you know? Yeah, I think a lot of most artists they don't even really understand what being a successful independent artist takes. So you know, it's cool. It's cool to just say you know I'm gonna stay independent and f the majors. I'll make more money this way. But they don't really understand like what it would take to make more money um, being successful as an independent artist or an artist signed to a label. Like they just just something that becomes cool and and, and fun to say. Um, I have. I have friends that are on major labels, like newly, and I know for sure they make more money than I do. So there's a situation that makes money. That makes sense. And I also know dudes that are independent that make more money than me and them, you know? So it's like, it's just about understanding where you fit into the the whole the whole picture and right. put yourself in the best position of reaching new people and keep growing, you know? Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't close the door to any situation. I would at least have the conversations so you can learn kind of what's happening in the space because there's the deals that are happening today are much more diverse than deals that happened 10, 20 years ago. Like signing to a major can mean a lot of different things. You know, it can be partnership, right. it can be traditional, like it can be distribution, you know, you just don't know what exactly you're talking about when you say, yeah, I'm working with a major, it could be a, a totally separate, separate situation. So never, cl- I mean, I'm not talking to you when I say this, but it's like, don't yeah. close off, don't close the door to anything, you know, without having the conversation and understanding exactly what's being presented to you. Yeah. For what sure. I love is that Dame is going to, is going to go public and say, Hey, everybody, I just want everyone to keep an open mind. And someone's going to respond with Dame wants you to be a slave. Um, <laughs> that's what that, that's what that's what recently happened with basically what I've been harping on the last week is that you know um, like people shouldn't even when people talk about their masters and like people are like never sell your masters never sell your own like to me you know especially as a as, not even just as a business person just as a like a logical just speaking logically like there's a fair price for everything. Like there's a, unless it's sentimental, unless it's sentimental value, it's like, no, I'm never giving this up because, you know, because I, I, I made it, I love it. Like there's a price, there's a fair price for everything. So it's about getting a fair price. If something requires you to give up a percentage or all of your ownership, then yeah. even Drake would sell his catalog for a certain number. I mean, that number might yeah. be 2 billion, but right. he would sell it unless it, unless it just held sentimental value. 
That's that's all I'm trying to say. I'm not saying you should sell your like people will respond and be like, oh, Dame's telling us to sell, sell our masters. That's why he's a that's why he's trying to scam artists and you know you sell your masters for less than what they're worth. That's that's the right the real. You know what I mean? Right. Funny thing for less than worth. It doesn't well, make sense. Yeah, and this is this comes from a place of people not understanding that the second you sign a deal with either an independent label or a major, you're going to sell your, your masters. You're, you just are. I mean, if, if Prince didn't have his own masters in, until, you know, decades after a lengthy legal battle, you, who are you? Right. So having, having said that, um, what I want to ask you to, to conclude, um, if the people watching this or listening to this had, you know, three minutes of time to check out your song, mm-hmm. which, which song should that be at this point? Um, I would say, damn, it's so hard. Because I have, like, I feel like an asshole for asking you that at the end of the conversation. <laughs> um, I think I, what I posted yesterday was my song called "Sweat" from my album "Pretty Pretty." I think that's like my most slept on song, and that's the that's the music that I like. Like that's what drives my taste more than anything else and it's so much different than anything you've probably heard if you just listen to the rest stuff um but also like that song didn't do what i thought it was going to and that always happens but i think if you just want to know my personal taste that's that's the one i thought i would say so you enjoy right. so you personally enjoy making the, the soul r&b stuff over the rap over the rap stuff oh yeah 100 percent so. I just knew that so I started out as just rapping basically then learned how to sing and kind of realized I could do it if I just practice and study it um, and then I started collaborating with a bunch of rappers just because that's what was in my network whether it was for their music or mine whatever and I was always like the guy on the hook because I was the only one that could sing right just like out of just pure natural like I'm a hook. That makes sense. I'm not going to have a rap verse and then sing or a rap hook and then sing on a verse. It's weird. So I was, did a bunch of collaboration and got a, you know, a good amount of fans through those. And they all just thought as me as like, that's the guy on the hook, you know, he's the pop guy, you know, where, but it was like, yo, I can rap well. And I probably rap better than the dude you found through. So I just decided to put out some rap stuff just cause like, I knew I could do it and I wanted to showcase it. And that's a good thing about being independent. You make that decision, you make the project, you put it out and you do it, you know? So I did that top of last year and people loved it. So <laughs> decided to kind of make that a series where once a year or however long, however often I want or however often people want to hear it, I'll just drop a short rap project of just like fun songs that kind of mean thing in a way, but they're just, you know, it's, it's kind of like with those, I try to catch like what's in right now and like move with the times kind of and like make hip hop in the way that it's being listened to. And then when I make like my actual like real albums, like Morning Coffee or Pretty Pretty, I try to aiming for like timelessness and like the best way I know how to do that is through like this whole stuff and like really tell my story and give my perspective on stuff, you know? So that's kind of my approach at least for now. Well, Dome, I'm going to listen to that and uh, hopefully stay in touch. I think I followed you. If, if not, I'll do that right away. Um, everyone check cool. out Dylan Reese. That's R-E-E-S-E D-Y-L-A-N if you don't know how to spell Dylan. Uh, well, once again, appreciate you, man. Thank you uh, for sharing your experience. This is the Music Entrepreneur Club podcast. This is episode 64 presented by BeatStars. Check out BeatStars.world for everything going on in the BeatStars universe. Um, Mondays and Thursdays, our free music mentorship program, our free music business mentorship program, the Music Entrepreneur Club is live. Um, Dame, what's the number to text so that uh, everyone can be alerted when we go live? So text MEC to 844-206-7800 and you'll get an alert before every session to remind you because I know artists and producers need reminders. There we go. All right. Peace, everybody. Peace.